Happy Mother's Day, everyone. Uh, Mother's Day and Father's Day are always, or can be, I should say, uh, difficult holidays for some people uh, because not everyone has uh, fond memories of mom or dad growing up and of those years gone by. And so it can be difficult for some. And so for that reason, a lot of times I don't usually bring uh, a Mother's Day specific type message uh, just to try to avoid that kind of hardship. You know, for some people, Mother's Day can be very hard, a very difficult holiday for them. Uh, but this year, uh, my message actually is entitled Mother. And so uh, we are going to have kind of a Mother's Day specific type message today. Uh, but I want to look at some mothers in the Bible uh, who are kind of a little bit more obscure, you know, not ones that we usually think of. And there's not really a whole lot that's said about them. And, and I'm going to be honest with you right up front. Uh, some of the things that I say are kind of speculation on my part, okay? But the lessons are still sound, the lessons are still biblical that we're going to receive today. And so these mothers that we're going to look at today, I have four specifically. I only had three, and I'll, I'll talk about the last one here when I get to it, but I only, have, I only had three. And they really, you don't even know their names. Their names aren't mentioned. The first one in the story that we read here in Matthew uh, her name's not, not mentioned, but we can piece scripture together and know uh, who her name is. And so uh, at least that the first one has a, a name, but the others don't. We don't even know who they are. And then the last one, mom isn't even really mentioned. Mother isn't even mentioned, but it, it, you know that she's there. And uh, we'll, 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 as I said, when we get to that last point, you'll see what I mean. So but uh, if you'd like to take your Bibles this morning and turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 20. And uh, we're going to read verses 20 through 28. And uh, so we're going to look at some of these mothers in Scripture and, and the things that they taught us, uh, the lessons that we can learn uh, in their interactions and their dealings with their family and with people in general. So, And they're good lessons, lessons that we all need. And so that's, again, why I kind of went with this message. It's just kind of obviously the Lord laid it upon my heart. And so uh, this is where this stems from, comes from God Almighty himself. The first one, the first mother that we're going to look at, uh, is the mother of James and John, two of Jesus' disciples. And as I say in the story here in Matthew that we're going to read here in just a little bit, uh, her name isn't mentioned, but we can piece other scriptures together to know that her name was Salome. Now, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. You know, my Italian her heritage makes me want to call her Salami. Amen? But anyway, uh, Salome, I believe, is how you pronounce her name. And again, not a whole lot mentioned about her. She is mentioned in a few times in scripture, but that... This story that we're going to read from Matthew is actually in three of the Gospels uh, that recorded it. So that's one of those things that sticks out in everyone's mind. Hmm, this was kind of a, a big event, if you will, that took place because it's in more than one. At least I think it was in three. It might have been two. Uh, but it's in more than one Gospel. And so uh, it, it sticks out and it's kind of a big event. And usually when we preach this story, we preach it in kind of a negative kind of sense. And so I'm not going to do that today because I want to draw something positive. A couple things actually positive. Uh, from what we're going to read today. And so as we read this, you'll see what I mean. You'll understand what I mean about the negative and positive type thing. And so if you'd like to take your Bibles this morning, turn with me to Matthew chapter 20, and you can read along with me. Uh, we're going to read verses 20 through 28, okay? And so let's go ahead and read our story today. It says, Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, and that would be James and John, worshiping him, worshiping Jesus, and desiring a certain thing of him. So they wanted to ask something of Jesus. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? And she saith unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on the left, in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, uh, Ye know not what ye ask. Are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink and of and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they, James and John, answered for themselves, They uh, say unto him, We are able. And he saith unto them, Ye shall drink a deed of my cup, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my father. And when the ten heard it, the other ten disciples heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. But Jesus called them unto him and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. Of course, he's talking about the Roman and the Roman government and the way they did things. Okay, uh, But it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. 
<coughs> and whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant, okay? Uh, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. So he teaches him. He takes this moment, uh, this, this question that that Salome, James's John's mom, come to Jesus and asks this favor, this thing of him. And so Jesus uses it as he always did as a teaching moment to teach those. And many, you know, times, and I can't remember whether I have or not, but many preachers, when we preach this, we preach against, you know, this request and this desire and, and this kind of a thing. And you can kind of see the negative kind of sense there in, in this story, but I don't want to look at it that way. I, I took, as I was thinking about this message today for Mother's Day and thinking about James and John's his mom and, and her bringing her two sons before the Lord like this, I thought, you know what? There's some lessons we can learn here. All of us, you know, not just moms, but all of us, people, Christians in general, something that we can learn from uh, this story and a couple of things that, that I drew uh, from what she did. And so that's what I want to share with you today. First one, though, uh, again, she says, she says, what wilt thou? Jesus said, to what wilt thou? And she says, grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the one on thy left. And uh, we know that in, in the last, the end, in, in the new kingdom to come, the Bible in the book of Revelation says there's going to be 24 seats, actually. And most Bible scholars believe that 12 of them will be occupied by the patriarchs uh, from the Old Testament, you know, the, the 12 sons of Abraham, uh, Jacob. <laughs> I always get that mixed up. I don't know why I got to do that. But the 12 sons of Jacob, who were the 12 tribes of Israel, and there's some discussion as to who those 12 are because there's different listings in our Bible. But anyway, the 12 tribes and the 12 nations of Israel, and so 12 heads of those 12 tribes, and then the other 12 occupied by the 12 disciples. And of course, there's a little bit of talk about that too, because Judas betrayed Jesus, and so probably he wouldn't be there. Who would be the 12th? Most people, myself included, believe that 12th will be the Apostle Paul, uh, which includes all of us Gentiles. That's where we kind of fit in. So, But anyway, and that's what most people believe. Uh, but she's asking that when that time comes, when his kingdom is established, and of course, they still thought Jesus was going to establish his kingdom then and there on the earth at that time. They didn't realize it was a future kingdom to come uh, when God ushers in a new kingdom a new heaven and a new earth and all those things and all the former things are passed away as the bible says but she wanted her sons to sit one on the left and one on the right and so we look at that and think well that's kind of proud and arrogant and boastful and presumptuous and all those other negative things that we could throw in there but again i got to thinking about this and i thought you know what you know what i see a couple of good things here and so that's what i want to think i want to accentuate the positive and that old song from years gone by. That's what I want to do is I want to look at some positive elements. And the first one, and I think this is very important, okay? And, and in the other scripture, it doesn't mention so much about mom being there, but this one does, specifically mentions that mom brings her sons before the Lord. And that's an important thing, amen? That's my first lesson. She taught us to bring others before the Lord. That's what Salome does, is she takes her two sons and literally brings them before Jesus. She has a request for Jesus for her two sons. But how important that is for all of us to take people before the Lord. Now, we can't do like she did and physically bring uh, people before the Lord. But we can, in several ways, bring people before the Lord, bring folks before the Lord. Obviously, I think, you know, in our minds, if, if you're thinking along the same lines that I am, through, through the means of prayer. You know, when we take other people to the Lord in prayer. Uh, do you pray for your children? You know, you've heard me say that many a time. I don't care how young or how old they are. Sometimes we think, well, my kids are young. I don't have to pray for them. Yeah, you do. I mean, that's when we need, we need to start praying for them. Even if you don't have kids yet, you should be praying for your kids. Praying that God will do a thing and a work in their lives and such. But throughout their entire lives, we need to be bringing our children before the Lord in prayer. Praying for them, that God would lead them and guide them and, and pray that they'd be saved and pray that they'd find a godly spouse and that they'd live a godly life and, and carry on with the Christian heritage that, that you're trying to teach them and instill in their life. But, you know, but not just our children you know this is what this story is all about obviously is bringing our children before the lord and in, in prayer that because we can't physically bring them before the lord but in prayer bringing them before the lord um but bringing all peoples people that we know and love and care about and even folks that maybe we don't know so much and care about but strangers or co-workers or whatever bringing people before the lord praying that god would do a thing 
in their life that God would do a great work in other people's lives. How important that is. But, you know, and, and this is more to me, to me, maybe I'm just splitting hairs here, but this is more than just praying for somebody. Okay, this is more, this is the effort that you see that, that James and John's mother took, the effort that she took to take these boys and to literally physically bring them before the Lord. And I think it's, that's what we need to do. We need to make that effort uh, to know people, to know their needs, to know what they're going through in their life so that we can bring them before the Lord and bring those needs before the Lord. You know, not... You know, not trying to impose our will in their life or imposing what we think they need, but just simply bringing this person before the Lord and say, Lord, this is what so-and-so is going through. This is what, you know, the choices, that the decisions that they have to make. And so taking that person and bringing them to before the Lord Jesus Christ and before God Almighty. So that's the first lesson that I learned from this, is that she took the time to take her two boys and bring them before Jesus Christ. We all can learn that lesson. Jesus even teaches this same lesson for his disciples as well. In Luke uh, 22, 32, he says, I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And so Jesus prayed for his disciples then while he was on the earth. And I guarantee you, he's still praying for us today uh, that our faith would fail not. And so if Jesus is going to take us before God Almighty, then how can we do any less or any little, amen, bringing others before the Lord? that their faith fail not. How important that is. So that's the first lesson that I learned from the mother of James and John. Uh, the second lesson, again, we, we tend to look at this in a negative light saying, you know, how dare she ask that their, her son should sit one on the left and one on the right. But let's think about this for a second, okay? What is she asking? She's asking that her children strive for the best. That's a good thing in my book. You know, it... it Sometimes we're, we're, we're okay with, you know, settling for less or whatever. And it, it's kind of the way our culture and our society has gotten, you know, with, and, and, and I don't mean to step on toes or be mean or anything like that, but like all this participation awards and stuff like that. You know, growing up and such, you know, I had those behind me pushing me to be the best that I could be, to do the best that I could do, to do well in school, to do well in sports. And, you know, if you're not good at school and good in sports, then other things that we can do. You know, I'm never going to be an artist or a musician or anything like that. I don't have those gifts, those talents. And so, you know, the best that I can do is to lead singing in church or something like that. Okay. But there's nothing wrong with that for striving for greatness to try and to achieve, excuse me, <coughs> <clears throat> to try and achieve some sort of greatness or, or the best, I guess I should say, that we possibly can. And perhaps you heard me say this in quite a few of my messages as lately, uh, but teaching us to be the best that we can be. Is that such a bad thing? But that's what G James and John's mother is teaching, that her boys would be the best that they could be. You know, not settling for status quo, not settling for okay, but just striving for better, for more. I, to me, I think that's a good lesson. I think that's something that we need and something that should be there. Proverbs puts it this way. Proverbs 27, 17, the Bible says, Iron sharpeneth iron, and so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. Okay? Are we personally striving to be the best version of ourselves that we can? And then also, though, are we as... Salome did. She brought her children before the Lord, but pushing them, you know, guiding them, maybe is a better word than pushing them, guiding them to try and be the best version of themselves that they possibly can. You know, a lot of times we want to bring people around us, friends or whatever, uh, close to us or near to us that will let us just kind of slide and let us, you know, a lot of, if, if you have a person that, that, that wants you to be better, Sometimes you shy away from that person, don't you? Amen. We kind of tend to do that sort of a thing, you know? And so I guess there's a good lesson here. I think there really is for us to be better, to do better, to be the best that we possibly can and to not settle for status quo. You know, I guarantee you, okay, when you buy a new car, you're hoping that the people that made that car at the factory were trying to be their best that day. Amen. <laughs> you can understand what I'm saying? If you got to go into the hospital or have surgery, 
you're, pr you're praying that that doctor is trying to be his best that day. And not it's like, you know what? I'll just whatever happens, happen. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? And so uh, this, to me, this is a good thing. It really is. You know, we may not you know, be building cars or doing performing brain surgery, but what we do is important. You know, even if it's, you know, working at a grocery store like I do. You know, some might say, well, it's just a grocery store. It doesn't matter. Bible says do all things as unto the Lord. And so I try to be the best grocery store employee that I can. You know, not to impress anyone, but it's what our Lord would require of me, what he would want from me. So that's the lesson that John, James and John's his mother teaches, taught us to be the best that we can be. You know, I think that's a good thing. So there's a couple of good lessons that we learn uh, from the mother of James and John. And as I said, her name was Salome, so we do know her name. Uh, the next one that I want you to look, if you turn with me in your Bibles, just a few pages over, as a matter of fact, in the Gospel of Mark, and so not too far at all, Mark chapter 1, down in verse 29, uh, we have another mother that is mentioned. <clears throat> in this case, it's a mother-in-law, Peter's wife's mother. And so the mother of Peter's wife, Peter's mother-in-law, but it says Peter's wife's mother in our story. I want to read verses 29 through 34, and we can learn a lesson from her as well. Okay, so look with me in your Bibles there. In uh, verse 29, it says, and, forth, and Jesus had been healing and teaching and doing all these things, and the day had come to an end, and he goes to Peter's home. Okay, and it says, and forthwith, when they were come out of the synagogue, they entered into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick of a fever, and anon they tell him of her. And so they told Jesus of, of his mo Peter's mother-in-law that she was sick. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she ministered unto them. And at even, when the sun did set, they brought unto him all that were diseased and them that were possessed with devils. And all the city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many that were sick of diverse diseases and cast out many devils and suffered not the devils to speak because they knew him. Now, okay, what are we going to learn from this story? Think about this, okay? Jesus had been in the synagogue and he had been teaching and doing miracles there as well. He was tired. He was exhausted. And so he said, Peter says, come to my home. So they go to Peter's home, Simon Peter's home. And so they go there to rest and to be nourished, to have a meal, to be fed. But when they come into the house, the lady that would be doing the serving, the lady that would be preparing the meal is sick in bed with a fever. You know, nowadays we don't think much of that. You go and you take a couple of Tylenol or Advil or whatever you prefer, and you go on with life. They didn't have those things back then. Many people actually would die uh, from the fever, you know, and not make it because they didn't have the medicines that we have today. And so she was ill and laid up in bed. And so Jesus goes to her. And again, I think this is in at least two, probably three of the Gospels I, in my studying. I forget how many of each one. But anyway, you'll forgive me for that. Uh, but it's recorded in more than one portion of Scripture. And in one portion, in one gospel, it says that Jesus stood over her. Another said that Jesus touched her hand. But the reason I use Mark, because Mark took it one step farther. It says not only did he take her by the hand, but it says he actually lifted her, 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 lifted her up. He helped her up. And it just shows the type of gentleman that Jesus was, the kind of man and full of love and compassion that he was, that he actually came and he touched her. And again, for a Jew, that was a no-no, to touch somebody who was sick. He didn't do that. You know, they were practicing social distancing back then. And so, amen. And anyway, you didn't do that. Jesus didn't care. He, he, he wasn't worried. And so he went and he actually touched her. And so I forget which gospel it was. doesn't mention any of the touching because it was a gospel written to the Jews. And they know that that would be offensive to them. So we'll leave the touching part out, they say. Uh, but the other ones weren't so much worried about that. But Jesus, not only did he touch her, though, but then he also took her by the hand and helped her up, lifted her up to her feet. And as soon as she got up, poof, fever was gone. Whew, better than any Tylenol or Advil I've ever taken, amen? It usually takes a while for the fever to go, but it was gone. And so that's the story. So Jesus can now, then as soon as she gets up, and again, we don't know her name. Nowhere in scripture is her name ever mentioned. We don't know what her name is, <clears throat> but we see the story of her. But as soon as the fever is healed, you know, you know how it is. You've been sick, you had a flu or cold or a fever, and you just weren't well, and you just, you know, weren't nourished. You, you're weak and you're tired. You want to what? You want to sleep yourself you want to rest yourself but as soon as the fever was lifted and she was healed what did she do 
she went in the kitchen and she started to prepare a meal for Jesus and the disciples that were with him to feed them because they were tired themselves and they had been working all day and they were hungry. And so she gets up and it says she ministered unto them. Okay. Why is this so important? Because as soon as she ministered it unto them and then Jesus and the disciples were nursed themselves, then all of a sudden more people came to Jesus and he began to heal more people and cast out more devils. And Jesus was able to continue to do the work that he was doing. Why? Because the, Peter's mother-in-law got up and fed him. What does she teach us? She taught us to minister to the needs of others. How important that is. And isn't that a lesson that moms teach? To minister unto the needs of others. How many moms out there sacrifice their own needs and, and let their own desires go by the wayside so that they can meet the needs of other people, whether it be their own family or, or families within the church and the community, that sort of a thing. How valuable a lesson this is. And, and it was a hardship for her, to, so to speak, because of the fever. But as soon as Jesus heals her, she goes and, and heals. In the last story that we just read, in, in the last verse that we just read, back here in Matthew chapter 20, <clears throat> talking about ministering to the needs of others, Jesus even said in verse 28, he says, Even as the Son of Man came not to, min to be ministered unto, but to minister. And that's what we're here for. Not to have people minister to us. You know, I get it. Sometimes we need someone to minister to our needs, you know, when we're sick or when we're ill or whatever, you know. But you know how it is usually within the home, the dynamics of a home. When mom's sick, everything falls apart. Amen. That's not always like that, I know. But a lot of times it is that when, when the mother's sick, it's just like nothing seems to get done, so to speak. Uh, but, uh, and so, but we're here to minister. And this is a lesson that we need to learn that, you know, even through a hardship here, a little bit of a hardship, uh, she's teaching us that we are here to minister to the needs of others. Jesus taught this lesson about us ministering to the needs of others. And here, you know, the, the whole story of the foot washing. Jesus, when he washed the feet of his disciples, was teaching his disciples that, again, he was not here to, to, to be served, but to serve. And he taught them, he says, you should do this likewise, not necessarily washing of feet, <clears throat> although some churches and ministries do that. And it, that I'm, hey, all for that, if that's what the Lord lays on your heart to do. But the, the story, the lesson behind that, though, is to, to minister to the needs of other people, to do that thing, to, to reach out to others. And, that, and that's how we share the gospel. A lot of times we have to meet the needs of people, those physical needs that they may have or emotional or mental needs that they may have. We have to meet those needs first before we can teach them about Jesus and bring them to a place of salvation. If a person's struggling with something financially or physically or emotionally or whatever, it's very hard for them to focus upon their need of salvation until some needs are met in their life. And so Jesus, or Peter's wife's mother, Peter's mother-in-law, teaches us a very valuable lesson that we are here to minister to the needs of other people. All right, I gotta get moving here. I got a few minutes left and two more to go. The third one then, as again, is a, is a very short story. And it's one of those stories that you kind of miss. Uh, but many of us are familiar with the prayer of Jabez, amen? There's just two verses in the book of Second uh, First Chronicles. I'm sorry, First Chronicles chapter four. But if you go through this section in First Chronicles chapter four, it's a genealogy. It, forgive me, but it's one of those boring genealogies. It's very hard. Not too many people actually read through those genealogies. I've done it to say that I've read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. But I got to admit, when it comes to genealogies, I skip right on through there. <clears throat> and this is one of those stories that you'll miss if you are skipping on through there. Because there's two verses that are added that teach us about Jabez and, guess what? And his mother. She is mentioned there. <clears throat> and so in 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, it goes like, like this. And it says, Jabez, and he's the man, and the prayer of Jabez and I'll read this to you here in a little bit, but you know the prayer of Jabez and a little book that was written and stuff, and we can learn some valuable lessons, and that's not my point. My point is about mom, but it says, and Jabez was more honorable than his brethren, and his mother, mom is mentioned, his mother called his name Jabez, saying, because I bear him with sorrow, and that's what his name means. That sorrow is attached to that name. We don't know exactly what she means. Did she have a hard birth? Was a hard time delivering him in, in, in birth? And is that the sorrow she speaks of? Or perhaps there was a difficulty in the family at that time financially? Who knows? We don't know the whole story. What the sorrow is. Most people think that it was a hard birth. 
And so that's why she called him Jabez, but we don't know that. It could have been some other difficulty that she was going through in her life at that time. Okay, And so, but whatever reason, but she says, because I bear him with sorrow. And then the verse that most of us know, Jabez called on the God of Israel saying, Oh, that thou wouldest bless me indeed. This is that prayer of Jabez, that he would bless me indeed. Enlarge my coast that thy hand might be with me and that thou wouldest keep me from evil, that it may not grieve me. And God granted him that which he requested. And so God heard his prayer and granted him that thing to bless him and enlarge his coast. Not so much that he would be a great man, but though that, that he would have more to give to others as well. But what's the lesson we learned from mom? Jabez was an honorable man and a man that went before God and prayed and God heard him and answered his prayer. <clears throat> Where did that lesson? Why? Why was he an honorable man? I'm going to say it's because of mom. Again, this might be speculation on my part, but I dare say that mother had a large part in this because what did she teach? She taught Jabez to serve the Lord even through hardship, through sorrow through trials and tribulations. That when the, the going gets tough, the tough get going. That's what she taught her son. And we need some more of that today. We need more of that type of a teaching and that, that more of the, those types of lessons to be taught to our children. So many times when things are hard and when things are difficult, people want to quit and they want to give up. It's like, oh, this must not be the will of the Lord. But she taught her son, listen, through hardship, through sorrow, we will serve him. And Jabez learned that lesson because he had the testimony of God that he was an honorable man. And he prayed before God and God blessed him and used him in a big way. God enlarged his coast so that he in turn could bless people as well. Isn't that a valuable lesson? But that's what the mother of Jabez taught him to be an honorable man through sorrow, through hardship. Do we teach that lesson today? Are we living that kind of lesson today? That through sorrows and hardships, we, we don't turn our backs on God. We don't give up on God. But we continue to go forward and do the things that God would have us to do. You know, a lot of times we look at people that serve the Lord through hardships and we think, wow, what a great thing that they're doing. I guarantee you, most of those people is like, that's just the right thing to do. <laughs> it's just what you're supposed to do. You're not supposed to quit. You're not supposed to give up on God, no matter how life, hard life gets. Amen? And so, but anyway, and so that's number three. And that, those are the three that I thought of, some more obscure mothers. And, and, and I was going to end with that and be done with that. And, and uh, we'd be at 27 minutes into our message and you know, we could be done. But there's one more I want to add. And the reason I did, because as I was preparing this message, I had my three and I thought I was done. And the Lord just kind of laid it upon my heart to ask my wife. And I said, honey, I says, can you think of any nameless good mothers in the Bible? And the first one that she said is this next one that I'm going to use. And I never even thought of it again because mother's not even actually mentioned. Her name's not there. She's not referenced or anything. But just reading the story, you know she was there. And she teaches us a very valuable lesson. And it's a lesson that I want us to end with today. Because it's, I think it's what mothers teach more than anything else. Moms teach us a lot of things. And we've already looked at three. Mothers teach us to bring others before the Lord. You know, how, how wonderful it is to have a praying mom. Amen. Mothers teach us to be the best that we can be. Mothers pushing their kids to get A's and B's instead of C's and D's. Okay. Uh, mothers teach us to minister to the needs of others because that's what moms do. And then certainly mothers teaching us to serve the Lord through hardships. You know, when things aren't so hard or so good, that Proverbs 31 woman, you know, that, that, that just tightens up the belt and does what needs to be done. So those are some valuable lessons that we learn from mother. But there's this one lesson that we're going to learn from this, this mom that, again, she's not even alluded to really but we know as we understand the story that she was there and you'll see what i mean here in a minute not a long story but it was at the feeding of i think the three thousand it could have been the five thousand but it's a story in john chapter six where jesus had a large group of people that needed to be fed and he turned to his disciples and said how are we going to feed all these and the bible story goes like this they brought before him he says there is there is a lad here to be a young boy, there is a lad here which have five barley loaves and two small fishes. But what are they among so many? And you might say, how does mother fit into this? And again, this, this is what I, when I asked my wife, this is what she said. And, and I, I agree with her. It's a good story. <clears throat> what is she teaching us? I'll tell you what she's teaching us. Okay. 
she's teach what we're learning here why is there a mom okay there's a mom because there's a young boy who has a lunch you understand what i'm saying i guarantee you this young boy did not pack his own lunch amen again this is speculation on our part i get that <clears throat> but if there's a young boy there with a lunch i guarantee you there was a mom that packed the lunch she did not let her boy go without a lunch or he went out the door to go listen to Jesus preaching and teach. And she says, hang on, let's get you some food, get you some bread and some fish so that you have something to eat for the day. And so this mom made sure that her son had something to eat that day. And of all those people that were there, now I don't know if the disciples were really bad lookers. They were not very good at this hide and seek thing. But for some reason, you're telling me this is the only feller, young feller that had a lunch? But they said, here's the lad. Maybe he was the closest, I don't know. But as he hears a lad and all he's got is these loaves and bread and some fish. What are they amongst all these? But the reason that boy had a lot was because of mom. Mother packed a lunch again. She's not mentioned. We don't know that she's there. We have to use our imagination and think a little bit. But I guarantee you she was there. What does she teach? Well, I'll tell you what this mom, she teaches us to love. She loved that little boy. She was going to let him go listen to Jesus preach and teach that day. Perhaps there was chores that needed to be done. Maybe mom even did his chores for him. Again, speculation on my part. I get that. <clears throat> but she took the time to pack him a lunch before he went to hear Jesus preach and teach so that he would be nourished for the day. And isn't that what moms teach us? They teach us how to love. We all need to know how to do that. How to love better. How to love others. To put others before ourselves and to love them. Just like God did. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Mothers teach us how to love. And the mother of this young lad here teaches us that love. To make sure that her son had a lunch that day. And because of that mother's love. An entire crowd of people. Whether it was 3,000 or 5,000. You have to go back and look. I'm not going to take the time to do it right now. Uh, they were all fed because of a mother's love. We have no idea the difference your love can make in someone else's life. When you love someone, when you take the time to love them and truly love them and to meet their needs, you have no idea the impact that that's going to have on down the road. The impact that you make in that person's life. And then they'll take that and use that to make an impact in other people's lives as well. And so mothers teach us how to love. John 15, 13 says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. That's what love is all about. And that's what the Christian life is all about. is us loving other people and laying down our lives for other people. And this is a lesson we can learn from mother. And so these are just uh, five things. I had four mothers, but five lessons that we learned. Things that we can learn from mother. There's other things, obviously, as well. And so I would hope that all of us would have a great Mother's Day. Whatever your Mother's Day looks like, whether you have a family gathering or not, or a Mother's Day dinner or not, or just a quiet dinner at home or something like that, doesn't matter. I just pray and hope and pray that each of you have a blessed Mother's Day. You know, who is that person that you would call mother? You know, that person that is near and dear and very special to you. You know, who is that one that means something? It doesn't necessarily have to be mom. Maybe mom's not here. Maybe she's in glory or whatever. It doesn't have necessarily have to be mom, physical mom. There's other people that could be special to us. I know in my life there's, you know, ladies that were there in my life to help me in my journey as I went to college and then Bible college and then the first ministry that we're at. And now that we're here, I'm very thankful for my mother-in-law. She's been aces to me. She's just been awesome. I'm very thankful for a great mother-in-law that I have. And so to all those moms and mothers and mother-in-laws and, and, and stepmothers and whatever, okay, you know, surrogate mothers, whatever you want to call yourselves, I hope and pray that you have a blessed, blessed Mother's Day. You keep up the good work and, you know, sometimes we look at ourselves, oh, I've not done a very good job. That's fine. The Lord gets it. <clears throat> That's just a sermon from this day forward. We're going to be the best version of ourselves that we possibly can. Putting our past behind us, because God does that. He forgives us of our sins and puts our past behind us and just move on forward for the Lord. But I hope and pray that you all have a blessed, blessed Mother's Day. And I pray that God would bless you in a big, huge way this day. Amen? All righty. Um, 
Tonight, I, I won't have an evening message. Usually whenever there's a holiday of some sort, we don't have a Sunday evening message. And so there'll, no, there'll be no Sunday evening Mother's Day message tonight. And so, uh, but anyway, but we'll meet again. I'll have a Wednesday night Bible study. And then, amen, next Sunday, May the 17th, Barrett's Chapel will open the doors and then we'll have services here in the building. Well, how wonderful that is to be able to have church in church again. And you know what I've said before, if you're fearful, that's fine, stay home. If you're ill in any way, sick, coughing, fever, stay home. And when we come to church, you know, try to stagger your entrance. Don't all be coming through the doors at the same time. Uh, space yourselves out, family, sit together, uh, place a pew in between each family, that sort of a thing. No handshaking, no hugging, you know who I'm talking to. No handshaking, no hugging, <laughs> amen. And uh, I realize it's different for us, but it's the precautions that we take. Uh, but we'll have services here together. We'll be able to sing worship songs and praise the Lord and, and just to be able to talk and fellowship and commune with one another again, encourage one another. How awesome will that be? And so anyway, continue to pray for our church, for Barrett's Chapel. Pray that God will continue to bless this ministry. He's blessed us through this pandemic and that we're still doing very good and thankful for that. Uh, but we look forward to seeing everybody again here at Barrett's Chapel next Sunday. And, you know, as we say, Lord willing, uh, who knows, maybe something will happen, but I don't foresee that. And so we plan on seeing everybody here next Sunday morning for our morning service. Amen. All right. You all have a blessed, blessed Mother's Day. Amen.